Yeah. John Lydon, I like that. I'm gonna, you know what? I'm gonna move back. That was very egalitarian. Hey, hello everyone. I hope the nice dinner yesterday gave you the energy that we need to start the third day of the conference. And it's my honor to present the first talk of the day that will be uh, with Oliver. So please, Rodrigo, is your the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks, everyone. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am new to rate of velocities, so I'm learning a lot this week. Um, my talk is going to eventually get to rate of velocities, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the development of starry process, which is a way of thinking stochastically about stellar variability. And I originally developed this for photometry, so bear with me while we, while we uh, ignore the wavelength dimension, but I'll get there eventually. Um, the talk is also, um, so um, a lot of this is just going to be statistics and, and probability and many of you probably know uh, a lot of this but it helps to be explicit um, usually this is what we want uh, at least as a Bayesian um, as a frequentist too so you want the probability of some parameters condition on um, some data um, well what you can compute is this right but what you want is this and that is why, well, if you don't want that, all right, enough from you. Um, usually we know how to compute our likelihood. And in order to, to transform that into a probability distribution over our parameters of interest, which some of us want, such as the probability that there is a planet orbiting the star, the probability that this planet has a certain radius or mass, um, we use Bayes' theorem and you know, we, we put it in some inference machinery. Um, Unfortunately, this is actually not usually what we have. What we have is slightly different, and it's this. We only know how to compute our models uh, accounting for nuisances. Right? So when, when I have a stellar uh, radio velocity signal, there's a signal of the planet there, but also the signal of the star, the signal of the instrument. And you have to model those nuisances simultaneously in order to not bias your result. Fortunately, there's machinery to deal with this too. And so I into that Bayes theorem. Um, so the idea is that our joint posterior is proportional to our likelihood, which we know how to compute, and our prior, which we, we obtain uh, elsewhere from prior information. And then um, what we need to do is we need to integrate over uh, those nuisances, we need to marginalize over them. And uh, fortunately, something like MCMC lets us do that. So there's some um, parameter, some dimension that we care about. There's one that we don't. And just by sampling from the posterior, we can numerically integrate over the nuisances to build up a marginal distribution over the parameter of interest, regardless of what the nuisances are. Even this, though, is an ideal scenario because quite often your nuisances or your high dimensional parameter space is a lot more complicated than just a Gaussian. Um, and, you know, so in, in this case, there's some degeneracy there with the nuisances, right? They're like equally probable values the nuisance could take off with some values in between. And the issue here is that, remember, usually you're in many dimensions here, and sampling from these distributions is difficult with, with existing tools. And so even though your desired distribution at the end is perfectly Gaussian and well behaved, in order to get to it, you have to go through this difficult sampling procedure where you have to count for all your nuisances. An example of where this comes up is I think a lot about modeling stellar photometric variability. And so we're all experts on this at some level. So I have a question, a pop quiz for people. Um, here is a light photometric light curve of a star over four rotations. This is made up. Um, I used one of these stellar surfaces to generate it. Can you tell me which one? So you'll notice before you before I answer, you'll notice that. This one has one dark spot, this one has two, three, and so forth. So the question is, how many spots are on this star? Yeah, yeah, no, you don't say anything. Raise your hand if you think it's one. Good. Two. Yeah, a couple. Three. Okay, four. Good. Five. No one. Six. I'm no one. Six. <laughs> the distribution does not integrate to one. <laughs> so. If it's not one of these, what is it? <laughs> Annalise? All of them. All of them. Very good. Exactly. So that's the trick question. There are degeneracies in this problem. These are pathologically identical in their light curves, down to machine precision. Um, and I, I can tell you how I constructed this later, but 
Um, you can explore the null space of this problem, all the degeneracies, to construct these pathological scenarios. And you'll notice that it's not just dark spots on the uniform surface. There's bright stuff, too. Those cancel out. And we don't expect stars to be uniformly bright surfaces with dark spots. They're plages, they're faculty, there's other stuff going on. And so these issues are probably not as pathological as they may seem. Okay. Um, this is, uh, so I think about information theory and no space and stuff. And so this is just a representation of what I just told you. Um, okay. <laughs> um, what I'm plotting here is uh, what I'm calling the variance reduction. I'll explain that in a second. As a function of, I'm not allowed to say this word. I, 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 I say this word a lot in my talks, and so I'm not going to say it. I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it. So it's a function of effective surface resolution. And now the variance reduction is how much I learn about, in this case, the surface of the star after I make an observation as a function of effective surface resolution. And so it's, it's te technically the um, one minus your posterior variance over your prior variance. So a value that's close to one means I learn everything that posterior can, it's really uh, constrained. Zero means I learn nothing by making a measurement. And there are a couple things you can see there are entire um, resolutions or degrees um, on the surface that you can learn nothing about because there are these, these uh, pathological symmetries where things cancel out, say, in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And then the other trend is that you learn less and less as you get to finer features. So light curves of stars primarily encode large-scale variation. Primarily, so there's one side of the object that's dark, one that's bright. That's about it. And by the way, the, the variance here, this is a function of inclination. So it depends on the inclination that if you're observing the object. And so that's just different samples. The thick curve is the, is the mean. Um, so, um, right, so there are these degeneracies. If we're trying to learn something about the surface of the star, which is what I've thought about um, for the past few years, um, we have to go through this difficult problem of, well, I parameterize the surface in terms of spots, but there are all these degeneracies, so it's really hard um, space to sample in. And so I, I want to consider a different approach here where um, we treat the specifics of the stellar surface as nuisances. I don't really, regardless of what my scientific application is, I usually don't care about the exact properties of each spot on the star. I care about things that physics can predict, such as the, the active latitude or something about the differential rotation strength. Something that I can model. This is true also when you're looking for planets, right? I if I'm looking for a planet, I don't care about the specifics of the stellar variability. I want to be able to model it, as I'll show you, as a, as a statistical stochastic process. I like your feeling that physics can predict those things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean it, at this, some level, it can, right? Differential rotation strength, that can the functions of magnetic field, the functions of the stellar age. Yes, <laughs> I'm an idealist, it's okay. Um, and so it's still the case, so in this thought experiment where we're trying to learn these bulk properties, these statistical properties, these you know, parameters, and marginalize over the specifics, which are degenerate, such as the specific properties of interior spots, we still have this problem. It's difficult to sample in. In order to get around this, I wanna focus on a second for how I would go about computing this likelihood accounting for the nuisances. So um, there's a, I'm going to give a tutorial um, after this on starry. And so this is how I would compute a light curve with a starry package. Um, and just bear with me. It'll make sense why I'm doing this in a second. But say I want to compute my likelihood. So I need to compute the forward model for a stellar light curve as a function of some parameters. And let's say I'm explicitly parameterizing the surface of the star in terms of discrete spots. So I put a spot down in the center, latitude zero, longitude zero, the star with a certain radius. So that's my first parameter, the radius of the spot. And then I compute some vector in some basis uh, representing that, um, that spot. I then rotate that stellar surface to the desired latitude of the spot. So the cool thing is that um, this is just a matrix rotation operation. Um, I can then rotate it to whatever longitude I want the spot at to be at. I then rotate it to the inclination that I observe the star at. And finally, one last rotation, I rotate the star in phase. I now have a time variable representation of the stellar surface, which 
we'll see in the tutorial later, I can linearly transform to the Likert, right? This operation is just a linear reweighting of these coefficients here. So that gives me a Likert. With the Likert, if I have a forward model, I can then compute my likelihood, right? So some, some Gaussian mean uh, model minus data, standard deviation equals my error bars. Um, so there, the, remember, the problem is that I can do this, but I put it in MCMC or any kind of approximate inference scheme, it's very hard to sample because I have all these degeneracies, multimodality, multimodality, you know what I'm trying to say, <laughs> multimodality, uh, et cetera. So a different approach is to skip this step entirely and to say that I'm not going to model my likelihood in terms of nuisances. I'm going to analytically marginalize over them, directly try to constrain my marginal posterior. Now, this is not possible exactly, but we can approximately do it if we assume that our likelihood is a multivariate Gaussian where the mean and the covariance are functions of the parameters that I care about. And this Gaussian has already marginalized over the nuisance. This sounds a little abstract, but just to, to make this a little more concrete, the way you do this is so it requires a change in mindset. Instead of having, having a definite deterministic values for each of these parameters, you instead have distributions. So if instead of a specific spot with a specific radius and a specific latitude and so forth, I consider distributions for all of these. And those distributions are parametrized by some hyperparameters, such as the mean and variance of the spot size, the mean and variance of the active latitude. So this would be, you know, like symmetric in the north and south, there's some active latitude. We can assume that the longitude is isotropic, at least averaged over all stars. And if you do this, if you do the same operation of rotating all these objects and then linearly transforming to flux, you don't get a light curve, you get a distribution. Right? Now this distribution has a mean and a covariance. That is the mean and the covariance of that multidimensional Gaussian that you're gonna use to model. That's a Gaussian process. So I've just described a procedure for generating a Gaussian process for stellar variability based on geometry, right? It's so their belief that their spots distributed in a certain way. And the cool thing there is that I don't need to worry about nuisances. The Gaussian process is doing the magic of, of marginalizing. Um, the details of this are a little nasty because you have to take these difficult integrals, right? So like the mean of a Gaussian process is some expectation integral where it's uh, some function of your nuisances weighted by the probability distributions. But fortunately, remember I said that all these operations are just matrix operations on, I'm going to have to say this, on a spherical harmonic vector. So these are Wigner matrices. Um, so these end up just being high dimensional integrals of sines and cosines, which we know how to take. And so the end result, and the, by the way, the covariance is the same, it, it, higher dimensional integral, but it's similar. But the end result is that because Starry takes advantage of the, the beauty of the spherical harmonic representation where everything's sines and cosines, those integrals are analytic. And in particular, they're very efficient to, to compute. And so I can compute a Gaussian process mean and covariance, which means I can compute a Gaussian process likelihood conditioned on some spot properties instantly in a matter of milliseconds. It's a little more expensive than computing likelihood for, for like a Celery Tay kernel. It's significantly more expensive than computer likelihood for a Celery Tay kernel. But the advantage here is that this is interpretable. So um, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to that in a second. So um, here what I'm showing are just samples from this Gaussian process, right? I have this multivariate Gaussian. I know how to draw samples from it. I can show the samples as light curves, and I can also show the samples on the stellar surface. So for instance, right, this would be a Gaussian process conditioned on an active latitude of 30 degrees north and south. This one is conditioned on a higher active latitude, so polar spots. These are large equatorial spots. These are isotropically distributed spots. Corresponding electrons are here. The different colors correspond to different inclinations. You'd see the star. These don't look like exactly like stellar surfaces. In particular, you'll see that they're bright regions. Um, the spots aren't circular. They're kind of blobs. So this is all part of the Gaussian approximation, right? That probability distribu that distribution of light curves is not a multivariate Gaussian. I'm making that explicit assumption that I'm approximating it as one. So the samples might not look exactly like what you'd expect a stellar surface might look, but they, they have these bulk properties that, that kind of make sense. 
Um, there's a there's an interactive animation um, if people want to check this out later. Um, but to show that this actually, so we don't want to just sample from the custom process, we want to use it for inference. And to show that this works, what I did was uh, generate a thousand light curves by actually coding spots on a, stat, on a uniform stellar surface, um, inclining these stars randomly, isotropically, um, drawing these spot properties from some distribution. And then I ran it through the inference machinery. So my parameters now are just these hyperparameters of the Gaussian process, five minutes. Okay. Um, so I have like eight parameters here, a um, thousand light curves. And the cool thing is that when I do MCMC, I don't need to have a parameter for every one of my nuisances, right? For every spot on every star. Um, it's just eight parameters. And so it's actually uh, really efficient to do inference in this space. And here's just the, the punchline. So the true stellar surfaces that I used to generate those light curves up top, samples from the posterior down here, they don't look the same. The spots are all in the wrong place, but statistically they look the same. The spots have the correct distribution of radii. They have the correct distribution of latitudes. <coughs> and so the true distribution of active latitudes or spot latitudes is the orange, blue are posterior samples. So each posterior sample is itself a distribution of where I believe the spots to be on all the stars and it's unbiased and I, I get the variance of the correct. Um, so I only have a few minutes left. Um, I, so this is what I was going to say earlier. So the idea here is instead of using one of those canned routines, such as, you know, the, the, this is the um, exponential sine squared kernel, which is commonly used for stellar variability. Um, I want to encourage you to think about using a starry process, which is also a kernel. There's no, um, I could write down the actual functional form, but it would take many pages because the, those integrals are computed recursively. But there's, uh, there's a package that lets you compute this fairly, fairly easily. And so in any case where you'd be using some kernel to model stellar variability, consider using a starry process. Okay, in the last three minutes, I haven't even spoken about radio velocities, but that's the reason we're here. And so I just talk, talk briefly about how to think about starry process in the context of EPRE. Um, we heard some mention yesterday about Doppler imaging, and that's the idea that um, here what we're showing are spectral lines as spots rotate in and out of view. They're actually um, introducing variations in the line shape because they're, they're essentially blocking blue shifted light and as they rotate to the, to the other side, they're blocking red shifted light. Um, the cool thing about Doppler imaging is that these lines, these spectral lines, if you measure them at very high resolution and very high precision, whereas for photometry, this is what your, your information theory content looks like, or your information content for a light curve looks like. For spectroscopy, it's all the way up here. There's still, there's still degeneracies, right? This, this curve isn't all the way up top, but the point is that with Doppler imaging, you can in principle learn almost everything about the stellar surface. There's always a backside of the star that you never see, and there's always some degeneracies, right? It's, like it's really hard to constrain the bite hole. Um, but the cool thing about Doppler images is very, uh, very informative about the surface. Starry can now do that as well with some limiting approximations. And the cool thing is that if this is the true surface, these are like the observations of a high resolution spectrum taken at different phases. These are samples from my posterior. The contrast is different, but you can see that you know the, the mean is correct and the variance is pretty good. This down here, all this noise, that's the backside of the star that you can never see, and so you're just sampling from your prior. But the, the important step here is that starry is linear, right? The, the flux, whether it's the Likert or the spectrum in radio velocity and extreme, for extreme precision radio velocity um, applications, is just a linear combination of spherical harmonic um, coefficients. So just right. Just graphically, right? So I have some representation of the surface, some matrix that started computes. One minute, got it. It should be fine, believe it or not. Um, um, and I get I get a time series spectra out via linear combination. The cool thing about a linear combination is that if your vector transforms this way, your covariance transforms linearly as well. It's extremely simple. You just sandwich your covariance between those matrices. Um, and so if I have a uh, covariance of a multidimensional Gaussian representing a stellar surface and spherical harmonics, I can easily compute 
the corresponding coherence and Gaussian process for spectroscopy. So uh, here's just an example. So I have these prior I mean, samples drawn from my starry process for you know mid-latitude spots, polar spots, and then large spots. I can draw samples from the spectral line as a function of time corresponding to that. And just just by rotating that covariance matrix, I get this. Um, and then I can obviously convert that to the radio velocity. And so these are samples of radio velocity curves for, for stars drawn from like starry process condition on certain spot. Um, so um, I guess the, the theme, so this is my last slide, I promise. Um, the theme here is, is similar to the theme from a lot of the talks yesterday, that instead of um, approaching the problem as I'll compute my rate of velocities from my spectra via some, some procedure, and then I'll model um, the joint uh, contribution of the star and the planet um, on my RVs and go through some MCMC or approximate inference step to take this integral and compute probability of planet parameters function condition on RVs, um, I can directly operate in spectral space where I have a Gaussian process with a known mean and covariance it's a function of parameters that I might have prior information about. Um, and then I operate essentially on the residuals of the spectra where I have, so this isn't really subtraction, I, I correct the spectrum for the Keplerian motion of the planet, but then the residuals should be um, distributed approximately as this Gaussian with this covariance that I know have. Um, that's it. Uh, so the rate of velocity stuff is still a work in progress, but I'd love to chat with people more about it. So thank you. Well, we have enough time for questions. So who wants to go first? No. Uh, thanks a lot, Rodrigo. Um, I have a. You compared briefly. Or you, you told us that forget about the exponential sine squared kernel and use uh, starry process. Uh, but how do they actually compare those two covariance functions? And in particular, is there how does that comparison? So they're different, I guess. But uh, how does that difference depend on those parameters? Ah, yeah. So. Um, so that's a good question. How do they compare? It's, it's hard to make explicit comparisons between them because, so so like this parameter here, right? I don't know what people call this, the harmonic complexity or or something related to the harmonic complexity. Um, it's hard to um, it's hard to have a first principles explanation of why it is the value that you that you found, right? So like you you can you can train this Gaussian process on rate of velocity or stellar light curves. Um, and you'll get a posterior distribution for that quantity, but um, it, because this kernel, um, these parameters don't necessarily relate to the geometry of what's happening on the surface, it's hard to compare across them. They, in terms of inference, it's possible that they can do just as well in some cases. Um, I haven't done that test, but the idea is that this kernel the structure of the kernel, and in particular the priors that you can put on this, you can bring that information from elsewhere. And so in principle, the, the predictive power of this kernel is higher simply because you're allowed to bring in information about, say, okay, I know that sun-like stars have spots that are really small and have active latitudes that are whatever. Um, it's much harder to place those constraints on the hyperparameters of kernels that weren't designed for stellar variability. Um, that said, in certain cases, the, the choice of kernel may not matter as much, in which case it might be that much faster to, to use one of those CAM routines. But it's something that I haven't, I haven't explored in detail yet. So, um, yeah, that'd be good. Okay. Um, the, the light curves that you showed before with different samples from different uh, configurations, we're looking very nice, but a bit like very stable in time. Oh yeah. Does this kernel has the can deal with like the typical changes of long term photometry and long term radial velocity? Yes, yes. So that, that's an excellent question. So um, the cool thing about Gaussian process kernels is that you can multiply them. And so my recommendation is to multiply a static or a periodic starry process kernel with a um, 
squared exponential or with a matern kernel uh, to add quasi periodicity. Um, and then and then you have to ascribe some meaning to the hyperparenthal, like the, the correlation length scale, and that's something about the spot evolution time scale. I am thinking one of the things that I'm meaning to do this year is to explicitly model the covariance structure imparted by, imparted by differential rotation, because that does specific things to the geometry on a stellar surface. And so that is something that I'm going to add to starry process soon, differential rotation. Time evolution of spots, you could probably also figure out a way to parametrize that and integrate over it. I don't know how well that's going to work. I, I recommend using just multiplying by a... By a okay, thank you. Uh, so so you, you were showing the likelihood just earlier. What are exactly the parameters? Uh, yeah, well... Um, what are the parameters of the spots that you consider? I see that there is the mean radius. Oh, yeah. So the radius, the, the latitude. Uh, and there was a parameter called C or so. Yeah, that's the contrast. contrast. The contrast of the spots. Um, so, you, so you can build up this. You can make the gas process function of whatever you want. It's just a matter of finding the correct parameterization that lets you take those integrals easily. Yeah. And so the one that I found was you model the spot. Actually, the spot, the one that's analytic is the spot radius is actually a, it's a, it's a uniform distribution between a lower bound and, a, and an upper bound. The spot latitude is, it's a beta distribution in cosine theta, but it kind of looks like a bimodal Gaussian, and so that has a mean and a variance. Uh, the there are no parameters of the longitude, we assume it's isotropic. Um, uh, inclination is a parameter, rotation period is a parameter, um, spot contrast is a parameter, although you, you can, it's not implemented in star, but it's easy to assume an arbitrary distribution for spot contrast if you'd like. Um, I think that's it. And then differential rotation is going to be one soon. Okay. So inclination is one parameter that you condition on, that, that, that is in your nonlinear likelihood. So, so yes and no. So you can that way. You can also marginalize over inclination. If you, this is more, this is more useful for, um, for stars whose inclination angle you don't know. So if I'm looking at field Kepler stars, um, I know that, I mean, like the, our, my priors, that's, there's no preferred orientation on the sky. So I can assume an isotropic prior and you can actually integrate over that. Yeah, there's time for another question, maybe two. Uh, Xavier? Uh, yeah. uh, thanks a lot, Rodrigo. Uh, so one question. So in radio velocity, well, there is two effects. There is like the photometric effect and there is this convective bullshit and emission. So here you are basically only modeling the photometric part of it. Right. So do you have any idea how you could include convection or because I would love to chat with you about that. And other people here too. I do not. I don't know. Because it has to be it has to be linear, right? There there has to be some way of linearly accounting for the effect of convective blue shift on the spectrum in order to go through this Gaussian process approximation. Um, you can linearize anything, but the question is, is, is it good enough? I don't know. But perhaps like more or less as a function of line depth, it's like linear, but oh, you could think about something. Yeah, linear, so I, I, I really enjoyed your, your description yesterday. That, that like really made it very clear what my goal is to try to model. Um, so that, that was excellent. Um, but let's chat more. Okay. I think we should stop the questions here because now there are some logistics that we need to do to start the tutorials. So let's talk uh, Rodrigo again.